She's not a high risk for surgery, is she? Or is he just thinking that she's more would be act more active if she was younger? No. No, she's not. Her stats are not great because she's not diabetes. Well, she has she's being treated for high blood pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Better diabetes is under control. Yeah. But anyway. So he wants to get in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's fair. Yeah. 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 Well, seems to be marginally better on some of the swelling. And there's nothing to do for it except hold it to the There's nothing to do for it except hold it to the lens. They're down there living. Afraid she might get a contracture in that elbow or, or a blood clot or something. We respect you. Know. <laughs> I'm talking to them, but now I ask you. How you doing? I'm talking to them, but now I ask you. How you doing? You guys doing good? Sims are doing good back here. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. What's up, Peggy Sue? Yeah. That's like, oh, well. Until I die, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I did not hear the bell, but we're going to go ahead and start. Let's bow for prayer. All right, let's pray. Our dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters. We pray that the study that we uh, have tonight will be one that will stir our hearts and will allow us to better serve you in all man. Lord, please be with Brent as he delivers this message to us and, and guide his heart and his mind. Help us to clear our minds of, the, of our world's issues and problems and that we can focus on the lesson. 
Lord, thank you so much for your son Jesus, for his love, and for his devotion, and for his sacrifice. Without them, we would be lost. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. So, um, we're in Proverbs chapter 4, as I stated, the, what's that, what's that what's the uh, chapter that Phil is going to cover is kind of some redundancy over two of them, so I just pulled back so that Phil can cover two of them, uh, however he's going to do that, and then make it easy. So, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 4, we're going to see if we get through the rest of Proverbs 4 tonight, and so what this was really talking about was what wisdom is going to do for us and what it could do. We have Solomon, and who's Solomon writing to? Chapter 4, who is he writing to? He says his son. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Oh, sons. If he was talking to his son, let me ask that way. Who is, because he could have been talking to many of them. Who would be included more than likely? Who is his first son? Rehoboam. Rehoboam. All right, let's just mark that real fast. So as we go down, he's talking about wisdom and uh, no wisdom, get to know her, don't, don't forsake her, verse 6. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. And then he says, wisdom is a principal thing. Uh, therefore, get wisdom, and all you're getting, get understanding. So when he talks about get wisdom and get understanding, we were towards the end of class, we talked about this. What does that mean? Personal effort. Personal effort? Marshall, get my wallet. You can have what's in there if you get your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Marshall would give it back. <laughs> now, you all saw that effort? Get something. So he's telling them to do something, make effort to get it. And so when we talk about getting something, I think that's where this gets a challenge because everybody wants something, but how many of us are willing to go get it? Right? We all want things, and this is where things happen in life when people get messed up. They turn around, everybody wants nice things, everybody wants money, everybody wants good health. Look, I want good health, but let me tell you what I'm not fixing to do. I'm not fixing to eat healthy, right? We had some friends coming from Cali yesterday, went out to dinner, she ordered a salad, and I'm just thinking, who's doing that? Because I'm not paying for that, right? I'm not going to do that. I, yeah, I want to be healthy, but I don't want it bad enough that I'm going to eat a salad now. <laughs> Right? I mean, exercise, but I still won't eat, right? Me and somebody were talking, Randall, I think it was. We we're talking about a six pack, right? And I said, what would I have to do if I wanted a six pack, right? And, you know, the Randall used to do crazy exercises all the time. So I'm running around Carterville or Germany, wherever you live all the time. And we were talking about exercise, exercise, exercise. And I said, what if I didn't eat right? You've got to do the other, you know, right? Forrest Gump running all the time. <laughs> he knows. Jake runs for no reason. And you ever see Captain like that, right? Oh. <laughs> Does he have a six pack under there? Yeah? Why are y'all embarrassed about the rest? If I had a six pack, it would be washing dishes all day. Brent, you do have a six pack. Well, underneath all the other stuff. Yeah. Yes. But like, think about it. Why do you eat healthy for running? It's harder when you don't. It's harder when you don't. That is interesting. It's harder when you don't. So. If this is our mind, and you have the bad over here, and you have the good over here, and you're pouring in, how easy is it going to be for you to serve God if you're pouring in an equal amount? Right? What verse does that make you think about? Lukewarm. Being lukewarm, I'll spit you. Either be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, right? You cannot get to hot by doing an equal amount of hot and cold. It just doesn't work. You're lukewarm at best. And what this is saying, if we're going to get something, if we're going to get to what righteousness looks like, we have to start taking away how much of this we allow into our life so that it becomes so small. You're never going to get it to nothing? No, but this side of good should be much more than what's coming in. And we believe as Christians that we can get something without getting rid of something else. And that becomes very important for us to look. So when he says get understanding, right? Therefore get wisdom and in all you're getting, get understanding. And then he says in verse eight, it says, 
Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring honor when you embrace her. So what does that mean? Can that be a trap? How many of us want honor? We're being truthful. How many of us like to be recognized or want honor? Right? And that's who we are as people. This, if you misunderstand it, could make you think, and that's why it could be a trap, that she will promote you, she will bring you honor. This is not talking about in the way that we sometimes want honor and want to be promoted. Are you ever looked at as being a good for doing what's right? How many of you guys do not get invited to certain events because of who you are? Right? How does it make you feel? At first, I felt bad because, hey, they don't want me there, mm -hmm. or whatever. But then it was like, okay, they're respecting me because they know I don't drink. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to make me uncomfortable. Okay. How many of you feel bad when you're not invited to things with other Christians? Hey, isn't it funny how we pretend like that's not a real thing? I saw you, Jack. Thank you. That's why I'm talking to you. Isn't that, did you? Okay. But isn't it funny how we act like, oh, that doesn't happen. It happens. I don't know. Why y'all tripping? You feel awkward and funny and what's wrong with me? Aren't these my people? Right? We all want to feel part of something. We all want to feel like we're drunk. We all want to feel like, hey, they like me. I, come on. They like me. I like them good. I'm a part of something. And so sometimes we can get messed up because we look at, you know, her being promoted and giving honor. You may not be invited to something for a host of reasons, right? It may not even be a personal thing. It could be for whatever, but because you just don't know, you don't know. And so sometimes we think that, hey, if I have wisdom or if I'm so smart or that smart is a relative term, if I am this, I will end up becoming a person that everybody wants to be around. I'm going to give you a newsflash. I said this before to people and I'll say it out loud. I think it's important. It is amazing how many things I used to be invited to before I became an elder. Amazing. And you know what happened that's the difference between me being an elder and when I wasn't? Absolutely nothing. I just want you to let that marinate for a second. Some other elders can say the same thing about that. I, I know that they could. It's mind-boggling because all of a sudden I'm an elder and I don't get invited. Have you ever not been invited to things since you were a preacher? Uh, I get plenty of invitations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plenty of invitations and not getting invited, uh, I'm trying to brag. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going home. See, I don't have wisdom to promote. I don't play. I can tell you the answer yes. But that's that's a trip, isn't it? Well, how does that even work? That all of a sudden, because of a responsibility somebody has, they get viewed as being different. I will tell everybody, I'm the same rent all the way through, whether you see me at work, you see me at church, and you see me at home, I act exactly the same. You know why? Because what's the difference? Nothing. And so we get caught up because we think there's some kind of honor. There, look, the loneliest job in life is being the job that's responsible for other people. And if you're not a parent, just wait, because you will soon understand that. It is a lonely job because you have a lot of responsibility. So here's this thing, and he says, she will, she will, verse 8, exalt her, lift her up. She will promote you. She will bring you honor. And when you embrace her, she, uh, she will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She will, uh, she will deliver to you. What does that mean? You know, at any age, male, female, Somebody that makes good decisions mm -hmm. and makes them consistently uh, it's just like a bright light. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, know, you see this, it can be anybody, but uh, it's hard to hide people that make good decisions and do good on a regular basis. Uh, yeah. They don't have to seek any glory because uh, they will be acknowledged by good people. Okay. Anybody else? So I would tell you this just because I thought it was sort of funny. Casey's been dating this young man, mm -hmm. and I like him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to like him. I know. But I, I didn't want to like him. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. 
One of the reasons I really like him <coughs> is because he's a 16-year-old boy who thinks before he speaks. He's he's very he's sort of quiet, and he doesn't just he's not like me. He doesn't he hits my head and comes out of my mouth. <laughs> but he doesn't do that, and I appreciate that. And but I appreciate that in other people, but especially when it's your daughter's boyfriend, you're, you don't really want to like him that much. And but he he, he turned that that gave him a notch up in my book. Right. And I was like, okay, I see you. Yep. Now let's talk. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay, it'll make you recognize is what Eric should try to a difference than the normal sixteen year old. Anybody else? What do you think that means, Tracy? Well, I'm just gonna say. It's talking about wisdom, loving you, and taking care of you, and all these things. It says talking. for you to love her, yeah. and lift her up, yep. Right, Go sorry. On. But wisdom is really of God. Mm. And so when you are partaking, or you're saying things that are wise, or saying things of wisdom, you're really being a light to the world. You're really showing God, you're really glorifying God. Yep. in your wisdom mm -hmm. so to me that's what I think it's going to shine a light on you it's going to lift you up it's going to carry you through because it's God's wisdom right you know and many people don't have God's wisdom right so to your point right I agree with you so Isaiah 55 7 through 9 somebody read that for me we all we all know this we've all heard it a time or two I want you to notice what God says here. Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. All right, so hold on. If you're wicked, turn from that. If you're unrighteous in your thoughts, turn from that and return to God, then God will pardon you. That's what, so God's looking to pardon, right? Turn from abundantly. God wants to abundantly pardon, but he said, hey, get away from how you do stuff. And then he leads into this. Keep going, Eric. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, mm -hmm. or your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. Okay, so I don't think the way you think, Justin. And my ways are not your ways, right? And then he goes on to say what after that? Uh, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So as far as you see the heavens and the earth, is that much span? Is that different? That's how you rationalize and how I rationalize. Thus saith the Lord. Actually, getting wisdom is getting the way God. Does. Ah, that's the what Stacy was saying. And so, go back and read this verse because this is what it says: exalt her the way that God thinks, the way that God, the stuff that God. Think about it. This is wisdom right here, and I think we miss this. Here's wisdom. Y'all want wisdom? Here it is. I documented it, take wisdom, love her, look at it, she will promote you. Promote you with who? Not with people, God's not caught up on that. Jesus wasn't promoted amongst people. She will promote you, she will bring you honor. When you embrace her, oh, what does it say? Oh, let me make sure, I, when you embrace her, it says she will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory, she will deliver to you. My question was, what do you think the crown of glory is? Has it? Crown of glory is only mentioned twice in the Bible that I can find. <laughs> I think that's talking about if we embrace God's word and if we were to really partake of wisdom and be obey obedient and love it and do what we're supposed to do, then we are going to have a crown of glory delivered to us. If we follow God's word and we embrace it and we love it and we follow it, are we not guaranteed heaven? Yes. Think about that. How dumb am I that I have the answers to the test and I fail? Now, you're a teacher. You probably pull off your belt and look some kids. If you gave them the answers to the test and said, hey, go take this test right here. There's the answers right there. They come back and inform you. Now, you can't touch them, but you'd be tempted to, right? Why? Because you laid it up for them. They had no reason not to, not to pass. Doesn't the Bible say that we'll be without excuse? It didn't go here. Yeah, we'll be without excuse. That's the that. definition of foolishness. It, it doesn't make sense, and it's just basically the opposite of living. Right. It doesn't make sense, and it's the opposite of living, right? It is foolish. 
But sometimes we as God's children act very foolish. And that's the point, right? Look, all of us are human, but and we all make mistakes. I get that. But there's a time where, you know, I think it said, well, you know, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, but now I put away childish things. We can't sit in that excuse forever, right? For the time that you should have been teachers, you now have somebody come to teach you the basic things again. And when he goes to the basic things he already talks about, a basic principle, the doctrines of baptisms. Bapti baptisms, it has an S on it. Because people are so mixed up, we sit there and have to talk about baptism all the time. You know what kind of things we should be talking about and discussing and going through, but we stay on the meat, milk of the word instead of the meat because we're not willing to do, get into God's word and really say, you know what, forget what I think my life should be like. I'm going to look at God's word and try to mirror this and how do I do it? And so now we talk about, Stacey, no? Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead because I'm going to pivot to go. Oh, I was just going to say right now when you were talking, I was thinking about Marshall. This one? Yeah. Okay. Marshall. Is there another one? No. Just make sure you can cover what you're about to say. I got you. No, no. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, I know he's in here. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> no, she'll say it to his face. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. But I was thinking about Marshall and how quick he got up to get that wallet. How zealous and Not until I said he can have whatever's in there. Right, right. He didn't right. move until I said that, right. by the way. Right. But yeah. that's the point. Well, we don't even get that when we get salvation. Right. And that is exactly my point. He got up quick. When he knew that there was a reward for him in that wallet, he got up quick to get that wallet to partake of it. And he was zealous about it. Yeah. And I think about that with our spirituality. I mean, we don't know how much time we have left. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a good thing for me to think about. It's edifying for me because I'm thinking to myself, how quick am I willing to get that wallet? Yeah. Because my time could be over tonight. You know, you just don't know. And so we have to do a better job, I think, of being more zealous and on fire and excited and trying to get all of God that we can get. Because that test could be tonight. So I'll turn to Matthew 13. I think that's why people quit following God because it, they can't do it that much. Or, you know, they don't do it then while you're turning there, but isn't that, what, jump I, on that, verse isn't that what Isaiah is trying to tell us? Yep. So when it talks about wisdom and it's talking about all that, if you if you go on reading, it talks about rain coming from the heavens and snow coming from the heavens. And God doesn't think like we all think in a 10 second window, no more than 10 feet in front of us. Normally. Normally what we think is how this affects us right here, right now. <clears throat> and we don't think about what happens four, five, six steps down the road. And Isaiah is trying to tell us the rain comes down, it waters the earth, it causes the flower to grow, it seeds, the, the, the farmer grabs a seed, makes bread, which feeds you. Okay. So God's thinking about, it's raining, Eric's getting fed. We're thinking, it's raining, I can't go outside. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to do that with your spirituality too, right? right? So you're going to bar. You're going to a bar to get a coke. Are you thinking about right here, right now, or are you thinking four steps ahead, where this is going to lead you, take you? You know, what are the possibilities of the bad things that are about to happen? But that's what Isaiah is saying. Yeah. You know, which is sort of neat in, yeah. in a really cool way because it's a, it's saying, hey, you, you got to think ahead. You got to be more. You, you can't be shallow. Right. There's got to be some depth to you, and especially. In your in your religion and your spirituality. Yeah. I just want to go ahead. One last mm -hmm. thing because I, I'm really being edified. Mm -hmm. Let me just say this: mm -hmm. um, we're not starving for the word, mm -hmm. and that's what Eric was making me think about the rain and how all all of it works or whatever. We're not starving for the word. We're kind of dry. We're full. We're we're satisfied. We're content with being just content. But we're not starving. We're not, you know, craving it like we should. I why? why? Why do you think that is? Uh, because we get complacent. Is it because we think that we're okay? We so, so hold okay. on. Let me just ask a point blank question. How many of you guys right now believe that if God comes back in 20 seconds, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're going to go to heaven? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve. Man, there's a lot of y'all missing. <laughs> Think about that. I said beyond a shadow of a doubt, 
If you have a doubt, what are you doing? Or what are you not doing? Right? I'm going to jump to a different verse instead to tie in what you guys just said, and I'll come back to what I want. Galatians chapter 6. Let's go there first. Somebody start reading verse 7. Do not be deceived. All right, what's that mean, don't be deceived? Don't be fooled. Tricked. Don't be tricked. All right? Do not fall for the okie doke. Because <laughs> this is where the okie doke comes. Go keep your arms. God cannot be mocked. God cannot. That's interesting that God can't be mocked because people sit there and talk about God, make fun of God. I remember going to a concert when I was in the, at Fresno, at the Fresno Fair. I think Run DMC, I was going to see. And Run DMC was in there and they said something about God and somebody said, F God. I, I was shook. I wanted to hit him in the back of the head. I I'll was, never forget that. I was shook was when I heard that. Now, was God mocked when that happened? He wasn't, because the Bible says, be not deceived, for God is not mocked. Now, they played the fool. God's not the fool in this case. They were the fool. And he says, for God cannot be mocked. God is not that. You may mock him thinking that you're mocking him. You can't mock somebody who's going to win. God already won. There's no, you can talk, think about how dumb, think about how dumb it would be if your granddaughter came up to me and said, I want to put on boxing gloves and fight him because I think I'm going to knock him out. I would sit there and just be, I don't, and then she could talk all the trash she wants. I wouldn't care. You know why? Because I know that that's not going to happen. And if it did, I'd move away. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, quick. <laughs> but that's how it is when people talk about God. They are beyond stupid when they put God and they say things like that. And so God is not going to be the one who loses. He wins. It's a guarantee. It's sold up. So, and then he says, keep reading. The man weeps what he sows. Now, that's everybody. We all will reap what we sow. And then he explains it. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. So, at the end of the day, if you are trying to please your flesh, you will reap destruction. That is cut and dry. Brent, when your decisions are about Brent, you're going to come up short. That's what that says. You're always going to come up short. No matter what. When my decision is about Brent, I'm going to come up short. Keep going. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will we eternal life. Now, whoever does things to be about what God has said, that result is going to be everlasting life. So don't be fooled. God is not going to lose. And hey, he doesn't want you to lose. You got it very simple. If you're about yourself, you're going to lose. If you're about spiritual things, you're going to win. It is that simple. Choose which road you want to go down. There's one that's broad and wide, and there's one that's difficult and narrow. Choose. One's about you. One's about spiritual things. One's about do what you want and be you. The other one's about do what God said, do and be about him. You make whatever decision, but in the end, make no mistake, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God, and God is going to say, now, I know that you must be crazy if you think that I was not serious about what I sent my son to die on the cross for. Because I was. Keep going. Let us not become weary in doing good. Uh, isn't that hard? That's the, that's the uh, kicker. I know. That's the kicker. Becoming weary in doing good. And that goes back to what Eric's point was. Mm -hmm. Right? It is, look, I'm a, I'll, I'll be 100 with y'all. I get tired of doing good. It is hard. It is hard to sit there and think about doing the next right thing when sometimes, I told Stacey, I think I told you guys on Sunday, that Sunday after church and Monday were just my day. I'm not doing that, I tell you guys that on Sunday. Yeah. I didn't, so I told Stacy and Sierra on Friday, I told Stacey on Friday, I said, let me tell you something. Long weekend, when we get to Sunday after church, it is my time. It's from Sunday to Monday. I'm not answering the phone, I'm not talking to anybody, I'm not saying anything, I don't want to see. It's whatever I want to do. And she said, you better tell your daughter. I said, Sierra! Sierra came in. Look, Sunday after church, 
Don't you don't see me, don't talk to me, don't breathe around me. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to see you. I don't want you to see me. That's where we're at. In fact, you got a test coming up. You study that test away from wherever we're at. <laughs> I need some me time. We're not invited anywhere, so it'd be okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he says you're not invited anywhere, so that'd be okay. That was beautiful. If I had a heart, I would have. That would have hurt. <laughs> so, so I did that, right? I took some me time and I went. Now, as I'm relaxing and just hanging out and doing whatever, I did feel guilty. <laughs> Make no mistakes, I started thinking, huh, I probably should call and check on this person. I probably should do, why? Because you know what? It's that battle. You can watch all the me time you want. After you get 20, 30 minutes of you time, you start to think about other people. It is a messed up situation when you start transforming from you to things of God. But it's a beautiful situation. Yes, sir. Go back to that question you asked all of us. Only 12 raised their hand. Um, I think it's more of we don't have confidence in ourselves. We know the answer, I think. And you didn't raise your hand. I go back to one verse, and it's Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse uh, verse 6. And if I ask everyone here who has faith, raise your hand if you have faith. <laughs> raise your hand if you believe God exists. Everybody can raise your hand. So read this verse. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have faith. For whoever would draw near to God must do two things. Must believe that he exists mm -hmm. and that he rewards those who seek him. Y'all, everybody's here. We're seeking him. Believe that he's going to reward you. You're going to go to heaven if you're doing those two things. And we have a lack of confidence that says, oh, maybe he's not going to reward me. But if you have faith that he's going to we got a lack of faith that God is not going to do what he promised us. And, that is. and, and I think, you know, we we grow weary in doing good and we lack that confidence because we don't necessarily see it in front of us. You know, the text in Proverbs is really clear. It's not, it doesn't say that, that people will exalt you. People will place on your head a graceful garland and a beautiful crown. It says, she will do that. Wisdom will do that. You, you may be despised by the world, despised by those around you, but you know, if you're if you're doing good, the prize is you know, more spiritual, more eternal than what you're seeing here. You right. just don't see the results, right? And and I think this is the real challenge. The Bible says, well, "We walk by faith, or live by faith, and not by sight." I think the reason why a lot of people don't raise their hands is because quickly they think about, how am I walking? Right? When you ask yourself that in five seconds, and you ask yourself, how am I walking? There's a difference of knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are doing everything to the best of your ability as you have said in the scriptures, and knowing that you're not putting forth that effort. And I think that's where people get stuck, when they think, you know what, I know I'm not putting forth the effort I should put forward, and for that reason, I think that's very clear that we should self-examine ourselves and say, you know, the Bible's clear. He tells us to put it in 100, go, that's what, yeah, that, yeah, he tells us all types of things, right? That question was asked 10 years ago, too. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but let me ask you a question. Have you grown over the past 10 years? So I remember the last class we were in, John made a comment. I'm trying to remember how you worded it because I thought it was beautiful. I said, it's something to this, I'm going to try to re-enlighten you so you can say it again. <laughs> it could have been a Johnism where you just throw something out and it sticks. <laughs> but it was something of, to the effect that God only requires you to do um, what you know. How did you word that? Oh, it was brilliant. Um, uh, the gist of what you were saying, John, was God only wants you to do what you've been blessed with the ability to do. Yeah, or <laughs> kind of. I'm trying to spark the John. I'm trying to spark the John. The John, to wrap up. <laughs> How did you word this? He wants us to obey His will 
to the extent of our knowledge. And so that yes. as we grow in knowledge, we should be obeying more. There we go. All right. Now, tell me you do that. Did you not get that fly? Did you not catch that? If you're growing every year in knowledge, then he expects more out of you. Too much is given, much was acquired, right? We use that for stuff, but that also comes down to your knowledge. And that's why the Bible tells us to study the show thyself. If we're studying the Bible and we're growing in knowledge, then guess what? God expects us to tighten up. So where you may think something was okay at one point in your life, and then boom, you get to a situation and you, oh, oops, it's not. God expects you to make a change. And that's where I think this thing becomes tricky, Eric, is that point blank, a lot of us only read the Bible and we don't study, so we don't really grow in knowledge. You know what we do? We hope to grow during Bible class and during sermons. And <laughs> wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. The answer is for you to take yourself home and work this thing out between you and God. And then when you come to Bible class, you add value to the rest of everybody else. And when you come to worship service, you glean what you can out of that to help make you better and you help encourage and edify others. But if you're not working this thing out at home, that is a problem. And I do believe this is my own judgment that is not founded. That that's where people struggle is because they do a checkbox. Yes, I read my three chapters today. Okay. What do those three chapters have to do with your life? Or how are you going to incorporate something? And I think that's where we have to challenge ourselves. So I, I make it a broad statement. I don't think that goes to everybody. But I think that's why people pause and start thinking. They start thinking, did I really grow? Right? Every year am I really seeing growth in myself? But I can't. Repeat his Johnism. Go ahead. John. John 1. <laughs> Sly 1 1. Can you uh, repeat that? God expects us to obey Him to the extent of our knowledge. That's why some are called babes in Christ because their knowledge is small. Yeah. But as we grow, as we know more, we need to be doing more. And as we read and study, if we see something that we're not doing, we ought to stop right there and start practicing whatever it is we've read or studied or heard in a class or a sermon or whatever. We should be putting it into our life. Right. Yeah, so, and to your point, he also expects us to grow. Grow. So, if you had with the Sly 101 and you had that we're supposed to grow thereby by the word, if you put those two together, eventually we're without excuse. We can stand before God. Whether we are a year in Christ, two years in Christ, three years in Christ, or 50 years in Christ, and we should be able to say all the same thing. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. doesn't matter, right? One year, two years, 50 years, it should be the same response. I have fought the good fight. The good fight, as I understood, has been shown to me at this point, as I, my knowledge, because I've been studying and going. So, so he says, too, that he's a rewarder of them that diligently see him. The, the yeah. problem is that many people have been Christians for 20 years. Yeah. But they've really only been Christians one year, 20 times. Woo! <laughs> hey! I'm going to throw my shoe at this job. Did y'all catch that? Yeah. You too. Did y'all hear that? That was slide one and two. <laughs> that's that's the truth, man. So but this brings up a really interesting way of looking at things. And I believe to a certain degree that the church is partly to blame for this. Yeah. Right? Um, it sort of goes along with your little diagram, right? Mm -hmm. We're still taking him back. You said we're never not going to be able to take him back. Mm -hmm. right? We're always going to be taking him back. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, we're told that there's no way we can earn our way to heaven. Mm -hmm. We're told that we're imperfect. We're in told we're told that we're going to make mistakes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, all these things. And so we, 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 we believe this, you know, it's like, well, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. um, You're saying we're conditioned to think that there's oh, always going to be a we, problem. We are so conditioned, okay. right? We are conditioned to think with good reason mm -hmm. because we're human mm -hmm. and we make mistakes and life goes on and there we go. And we're trying and the efforts there, but personally, I, I don't believe I'm ever good enough. Yeah. Right, I, I'm, I'm never good well, which enough. Which none of us really are. But right. Keep going. So, yeah. so that makes me. So when someone goes, "Are you sure you're going to heaven?" Mm -hmm. I go, "I'm not good enough." 
on my own, I am not good enough. I, I can't do this journey that's by and that's, myself. And that's true. Right? Yeah. And, right. You and, can't. And, and we're all going to get there. Our, our righteousness is filthy rags, the Bible well, says. And going to John 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Thessalonians that's says. That's sly 1.1. One, one, or John 1.1. One, one, yeah. But it, Thessalonians says that God will punish those who do not know him mm -hmm. and those who do not obey him. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So. Am I going to be perfect? Am I always going to obey him? And Eric said something that was really good that we're striving. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying, we're striving, we're going, we're doing, we're, we're constantly working towards that goal. Me and Cecily were talking about this earlier. Where we always fall down on the job is that we do not give God enough credit with grace. Right? No, grace is not like a piece of pie. It's not like, oh, here's one piece, take this. Oh, I'm sorry, there's no more pie for you. But I totally so get put limitations why, on God's grace. But I totally get why people go yeah. they they falter to raise their hand. We're sort of conditioned not to raise our hand. Okay. We really are, and we got to get over that, and we got to give God more credit. Well, that's the so, devil at work. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm a, I'm gonna answer, but I want to get Doug. I know uh, you're going. Go ahead. Hebrews six uh, kind of answers that. Hebrews six, uh, really the whole chapter, but about verses eleven and twelve. It's really not about us. It's about God. God, if you ask the question, how many of you think God's a liar? Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks God's a liar. Right. Well, the salvation, there's two things. God's made a promise. Mm -hmm. God keeps his promises. Mm -hmm. And Hebrews 6 has, have faith and diligence. Mm -hmm. You keep working at it. But the reason we have Jesus Christ who died on the cross is for us to do our part. He's done his part. Mm -hmm. And God, another passage in Romans 8, it talks about God is for us. Mm -hmm. God's not against us. Mm -hmm. uh, he's gone to extraordinary lengths mm -hmm. for us to be saved. And don't, none of us should fail. Right. If we do what, though? But you said it, it's Hebrews 6. If we keep working at it. Right. Our, and, 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 and that's the point that I want to be very clear. I think that's where we get messed up. Is And that's why Galatians 6 is important. This is what he says. God, you know, don't be deceived, don't be fooled. God is not met. Whatever man soweth, that, that shall he also reap. If you stop sowing, meaning you're no longer diligent, you're not going to reap. You're not, you're sowing to the flesh. And if you sow to the flesh, not working is sowing to the flesh. Let's be very clear about that. Not working, yeah, but you're sowing to the flesh, right? He's saying sow to the spirit. And then he says, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Don't stop doing good. I'm challenging us to say that the reason why, because I used to be just like that, eh, I don't know. And then I started, as I kept studying and started going, I started thinking, you know what, Brent, is there any, I would ask myself this question, is there anything that you're aware of that's standing between you and God, right? I remember I used to get, many of us should have been asked by Chuck and went down, how's your walk with Christ? That was Chuck's question. That's a much deeper fundamental question, right? And if I said, eh, my walk is weak, well then, is that Christ's fault or my fault? That's where this thing becomes important. Christ is sitting there, I've laid it down. The Father says, I sent them. We can be rest assured, you're right, our biggest cheerleader. At what point do I stop walking towards him? That becomes the problem. And so I think when we talk about grace, we can have grace as long as we're walking towards him, as long as we're diligent in that. When we stop, we shoot ourselves, Stacey. I was gonna say, and I, and I don't want this to come off wrong, because you know, sometimes I just talk. But, um, <laughs> but I was just gonna say that with the whole grace thing, I think that a lot of times, and yes, God gives us grace, and yes, and we can't earn it, and all of those things. But a lot of times we talk to people who, who say that they're Christians, and they will fall on that. They'll say, well, yeah, I know I'm cheating on my wife, but God's grace will yeah. save me. Or, yeah, I know, you know, I struggle with drugs or alcohol, but I can fall on God's grace. They feel like they're still going to be fine. So if you die in that state, you feel like you're going to be fine. And they feel like, yes, I'm going to be fine. So we have to be careful with that, you know, and how we look at it. For us that, you know, are walking towards God, who are walking in the light, yes. But there are people who think, Christians who think, that even though they have sin in their life, and I'm talking about not a sin that you just do like mm -hmm. speed. I'm talking about something where you're continual. Yeah, a practicing sin. 
you have sin in your life, God's grace is not going to cover you. And he is not a liar, for he has said that those who are practicing such things will inherit hell. So my whole thing is, is that we have to just be careful with that thing, with that whole thing. How we say that, how we present that, and whatnot. Because a lot of people will justify themselves, and they'll say, well, God's grace will cover me. I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to go down to the bar and do this, or whatever. God's grace will cover me. He knows I'm not perfect. Yep, and they use it as an excuse to sin, and it's not an excuse. Right, and, and there it's a, that's the striking part. And I'm just going to say what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, <laughs> beginning in verse 5. But also for this very reason, given all diligence, that's that striving, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness uh, love. For if these things are yours and abound, if you have these things and they are demonstrated through your life, if you have these things, right. you want the litmus yeah. test to know if you should raise your hand? If you have these things and they are bound, they are of you, these things that we just read, this is, you want to know what the, what the cheat sheet is? Here it is, right? I read cliff notes all the time in school. Here's the cliff notes of the Bible. For if these things are yours and are bound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and it has forgotten that he was cleansed from his sins, uh, from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, even be more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Cliff Notes Version. Do that. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, too, <clears throat> this may be more of me than I'm sure somebody else does too. Um, and with confidence, it's hard to remember that we are to compare ourselves with Him. Yes. Just don't compare yourself by yourself. Right. Or with Him. Amen. Else. And it's a very hard thing because yep. you look at the person next to you and your mind automatically goes, Well, I'm doing better than they are. Right. <laughs> or you look at someone else and you're like, I'm not as good as they are. I'm like, My hand is. <laughs> that was great. You can take that either way. Yeah. And you don't want to lack humility in raising your hand because you're thinking, what's the person beside me thinking? If I think I'm going to heaven and they're looking at me going, well, I'll be better than her. It is a constant battle instead of just you. Right. right. And that's the everybody. problem, right? We focus on each other, which, I'm going to newsflash already. Don't tell nobody this, but I don't have a heaven or hell to send you on to. The person we should be really talking and worried about that with is who's going to judge us. Think about it. God already knows what we know, and even more so, right? That's the crazy part. That's where we get tripped up. So this is how I was going to end it. Ray of Bone. Remember what that junkie did? His, his dad tells him, I gave you all this wisdom, all this stuff. Ray of Bone goes, and he gets his friends who tell him, the older generation tells him, hey, be kind to these people. Don't treat them bad. And then his friends come and say, no, nah, man, you need to go ahead and turn up the heat on them. If you do that, they're going to respect you even more than your father. What was the problem? Yes. Himself. He wanted more pride in himself. Anytime you put yourself in a decision, it is not wisdom. It is of physical, worldly death. Do the right thing all the time. And God gave us pattern to the right thing. All right. Mel Ford will teach on Sunday. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.